Good afternoon, fellow citizens. Welcome to the Citizens Chat Show here on the Civic Space TV, the virtual episode uh, as we, we maintain social distancing. My name is Demiano Masesa, your show host. Today, we are discussing the Uganda and the identity politics in Uganda, which were for the East African Federation. My panel today is full of uh, knowledge and experience around these areas we are going to discuss. And uh, to begin with, I want to start with uh, uh, Ndugu Tegule. I want to have my panelists uh, join me today is uh, uh, Gawai, uh, an advocate of the High Court of Uganda. And also, I don't know whether this is right, the director at a conference on democracy in Africa, but also you 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 are a very strong writer in the in the monitor. We we see a lot of your 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 writings. Good to see you and good to hear from you, uh, Tegule, today. Pleasure, thank you, Damien. Happy to be here and uh, warm regards and hugs to Sarah, to uh, Fande Yoga Dola, Arinaitwe, and, and Joseph. It's, ha ha it's nice to catch up with you guys. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, then uh, the other guest that we have is uh, Elder Yoga Adola. Um, he's, he's one of the leading UPC ideologues and also uh, a member of the, the Central Committee of the FRONASA in the early 70s. Uh, I think he's uh, one of the two surviving uh, members of FRONASA, but also he always uh, jokes around and says he's the only historical that has never eaten. Uh, good to see you, <laughs> Elder Yoga. Yes, thank you. There are only two in the early 70s. That is me, and the other one is uh, Mr. Yo Erum Seven. Uh, the rest of us have gone. Good to see you. Yeah. May their souls rest in peace. Yes. And then uh, we have our regular panelists. I will start by how I'm presented here. We'll start with uh, uh, Joseph Ocheno, uh, one of us uh, is a UPC contender and a regular panelist with us here. Uh, Joseph, you're welcome, sir. Good to be here. Uh, good to be with uh, my Elder Yoga, and indeed my good friend and fellow Mukedi, uh, Te wa, wa te gule, and of course, uh, Sarah, you're looking great, and so is uh, young uh, Arina. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Joseph, yes. And also, we have, next is uh, uh, Arinito Rugendo, is uh, a journalist, but also the executive director with Media Spain. Thank you very much. Good to see you, um, to see you too, uh, Damien. Great, good to meet um, um, the ideologue behind Fronasa, which I have followed since I was a very little boy up to now. Good to see you, your uh, comrade Yoga, and I salute you, sir. And my colleague and uh, comrade in arms in the journalism world, Gawaya Tegule. You are growing old. You 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 are graying. You are graying. I don't know what's happening. Are you reading a lot? I don't understand what's going on. <laughs> you, you will, graying that doesn't mean getting old. Gray. <laughs> oh yes, that means he's graying gracefully, which is very good. Uh, God has been. See you all. God has been. And my good. sister Sarah, as well as Joseph. Um, I wanted to see your face, but I don't know what has happened today. Uh, but you know, I have promised the moment you become president of UPC, you know, I am, um, I will be, I'll be somewhere nearby. Granted. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, uh, Rugendo. Then finally, we have uh, Sarah Birete. She's a lawyer also, but also uh, the executive director with the Center for Constitutional Governance. Sarah, you're welcome. And also happy belated birthday. Uh, just a few days, we're eating your cake. Well, thank you, Damien, and uh, good afternoon, fellow panelists. It's nice to have you all on the call. Gawaya Tegre is my friend who keeps far, and I had taken time without uh, chatting with Yoga. And nice to see you, Regen and uh, Ocheno. Yeah. 
Yeah, good to see you. Thank you, Sarah. And uh, right into the discussion, I, I will not uh, hesitate, but to start with uh, uh, Tegule, let's start from there. Let's start from there. Uh, once great allies, President Kagame and Museveni, are becoming more and more critical of each other, risking conflict in East Africa and the Central Africa, uh, at stake are big investments, uh, regional leadership, and the East African community as a regional bloc. What is the problem? That's a very difficult question, um, Damien, because it is hard to know what the problem is. I always tell people that um, I think we need to analyze the Uganda Rwanda standoff very carefully because uh, Rwanda and Uganda, of all the South African countries, are, are maybe the closest in terms of blood relations in terms of the politics and the economy, in the sense that um, when Rwandese are in Uganda, you cannot tell whether they are Rwandese or Ugandans. And uh, the same thing when, runners, when Ugandans go to Rwanda, uh, because there's so much happening that it's, it's no longer possible to uh, differentiate between Ugandans and Rwandans. I don't think it's even necessary anymore anyway, um, because I think we're one people. I think that's to me, what is uh, what we should bear in mind that we're really one people, uh, more than we are with maybe any other East African nation. Uh, if you look at our political history, I think everything is intertwined. Um, more than half the leaders of Rwanda actually are Ugandans, technically for all intents and purposes. I think they know Uganda, they understand Uganda more than most of us Ugandans do. Uh, these are harsh reality, These are realities that we need to. Um, appreciate whether they sound pleasant or they do not. Um, everybody, if you look at the Rwanda government, if, if they relocated here in Uganda, it would be like nothing has changed because they, most of them grew up here, for heaven's sake. They were educated here. They know the ins and outs of this country. And uh, although, again, that's where it becomes a problem if we're conflicting with them, then it is hard to beat somebody who knows you inside out and back to front. So I cannot tell you that I know what the problem is because we are so intertwined, so interlinked. And um, I mean, we are brothers. And uh, sometimes you can, you can analyze this problem at basic levels, at political level, at the, sometimes we can look at the economics. But I think you want to concentrate more maybe on the personalities because these people, like I said, are one of us. They're part of us. Um, Museveni, Mr. Museveni and Mr. Kagame, these are, these are literal brothers. They know each other. They have grown together. They have fought together. There is so much that unites us that I'm struggling to see why we've been looking for things that divide us in the, in, in the very first place, because we, we really are one people. So I can tell you uh, with confidence that I do not know what the problem is. That one I can tell you. And I'm surprised there isn't a, isn't a problem because we are so similar. We are so together there really should not be a problem. I think we should be actually working together better because we know each other better, because we've grown up together, because we are so interlinked. I want to point out that we've fought Rwanda, uh, at least directly, maybe three or four times. But what you notice that each time we were fighting, uh, buses were moving from Kampala to Chigali and back uh, without any, any interference. So we were killing each other in Congo, I can also tell you that Uganda, I think, bore the brunt of the, the, the losses in Congo, which, which is not very funny, by the way, uh, but which also speaks to the nature of the methods of work of, of Rwanda and also of Uganda. I think we're two different, we have two different paradigms of work when it comes to engagement, basically doing everything, where so, the runners are more efficient. So usually they better us at everything that uh, every time there is a comparison, they better us at best, most everything. But what I'm saying is that there, we were fighting in Kisangani while people were crossing the border without any problem. And that tells you that uh, the problems we are seeing are not between the Ugandans and the Rwandans. I think the problems are primarily between those who are in the leadership of Uganda and Rwanda. I would want to maybe take the people a little bit out of this. Uh, let us focus on there. I think that's where the problem is. I don't know what it is exactly, but that is where it is. Over to you, Damien. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Tengule. And uh, possibly we'll get back to, to this. I, I want to invite in uh, 
elder yoga. I know you're not comfortable and you don't want to highly discuss this, these two areas, these two people all around here, Rwanda, Uganda, but we, we just want to pick your mind on this issue here. What could be the problem, really? Well, I am not living very near Rwanda, but I am hearing rumors that probably President Kagame may not be that well in the mind. I don't know what you people hear there, but I find it strange that Rwanda can close its borders with Uganda. Not that I'm on any side, but it just doesn't make sense to me. Uganda, Rwanda needs Uganda much more than Uganda needs Rwanda. And uh, Rwanda needs that border open much more than Uganda needs. And I find it strange that this thing can, the border can be closed against Uganda. This sometime living far away from there makes me begin to believe that probably the mind of the Rwandan president may not be well, as they say, around here. That's the most I can say at the moment. Thank you very much. We, we shall interrogate that further. Rujendo, yeah. you, you are, you, you're not, uh, you've, you're not, uh, th that is your area, I would say that is your second home, that you can even uh, speak one or two words from, from that area. I want you to, I want to get you here. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Muzo Yoga <laughs> has really put the bar so high. I don't know where to start from. Because... <laughs> <laughs> no, I've confessed my ignorance. <laughs> yes. Um, well, it is true. I am born from a, a district that is close to the border, that, and that is in Tungamo, where I, sh I think I, I share that district with President Museveni, with his wife, all the children and grandchildren, and including uh, General Muntu. Many, there are so many who come from that area, Augustine Rosindana, you know, around that whole area. So basically, like uh, my brother Gawaya has just said, is no, I, 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 I so find it difficult to understand what the problem between Uganda and Rwanda is, because there is no problem between the communities, this side of Ntungamo and the other end, which is, uh, okay, like Kajitumba areas and, and across. So, so it is, it is, it is so difficult to understand what it could be because the people of both countries have no problem. And I know so many friends, so many village mates who just walk across and come, even up to now they cross. Because that, that particular border between Uganda and, and Rwanda, the, the, the one they call Meramahiris, that's the one in, in Rohama constituency, which is the former constituency of the first lady. Nagana and this other one, um, uh, the main one, which is Katuna. Appears to be between the leaders. It is the leaders who know where the problem is because whenever um, something happens or has happened, especially in the recent past, the, it's not the same has allowed his people to talk. For them, they discuss the problem between Uganda and Rwanda. Here in Uganda, nobody is supposed to talk. Some of us who tried to talk, you know what happened in 2017. I spent 83 days in prison, starting from Narfanya, I ended up at, uh, at, at Rizira. And then uh, the newspaper had, had to be closed for, I think, 86 days. And after that, it, has, it was opened. But what we had said was more or less like trying to to touch a certain pulse that was that had been going on without the knowledge of everyone, that something had gone wrong. And for me, I can I, I, that's how best I can describe it. It's the leaders that must tell us because the, the ordinary persons don't have a problem. It's in the, prob the problem between Rwanda and Uganda only amongst the leaders and then social media activists from this side and the other end. You know, sometimes engaging in in, in in verbal exchanges, and that's where it stops. Mm -hmm. So, 
Is there something that we don't understand between President Museveni and President Kagame? And what we ordinary citizens do? Because, uh, you know, and I agree with the, with the yoga, Adora, that, you know, um, whatever the case, Uganda is the big neighbor. And even, even in terms of, 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 of economic uh, size, of course, Uganda has lost. Both countries actually have lost in terms of business volumes and the border communities. I have relatives really around Katuna there, you know, and, and they tell me they, their shops have closed. They can no longer send things across the border. And uh, so ultimately, the proverbial, it is the proverbial fight between elephants and then the grass suffering. So I think the discussion needs to, 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 to really rotate there. Why are elephants fighting? They're too huge for the grass to understand why they are fighting. And 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 I think the resolution is is, is, is around there. And uh, I hope maybe the discussion will, will unravel it. May I can say, I have two leaders really who don't seem to want to understand what exactly uh, is the reason for their fight. Because uh, uh, frankly speaking, from my own experience, both citizens have no problem. You know, there are relatives across there, relatives this side. You know, people, Rwandans have learned this way, have businesses, their children are studying here. They come via Rwanda Air. You can also go there, nobody asks them one or two things. So, I, I, I have a theory, which I have told some people before, and I am still really trying to follow it, to see whether actually this has happened. Is this a case of two powerful leaders trying to create a momentum, a, a moment that hoodwinks all of us to imagine there is, there is a fight between the two countries when actually there isn't. I, 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 it's something I want to understand. Because, and, and then if that, if that is that, that ima imaginary conflict, that makes sure that the two states, the two ruling parties uh, uh, consolidate power, you know, by uh, by imagining a fight, and 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 and, and because it has got me for me thinking to that level now to understand to, to try to, to to decode what the problem could be because ordinary people cannot see the problem, journalists can't see the problem, all forms of investigators have verified the problem. So so what is this fight about? And so if we imagine that we're going to becoming too powerful. We are finished here in Uganda, so we say, okay, we better stay with, 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 the, with, with the devil we have. The same on the other side, because in Rwanda, for example, I have discovered citizens have, been, have all been told that Uganda, especially President Museveni, is working very, very hard to finish them. Like they suffered during the genocide, this is what is going to happen again. This way, of course, it's a different situation, but why? Why are Rwandans being told that President Museveni wants to finish them? And, and that's the narrative. When you speak to people from even the high echelons of government, I have friends in the, in the, in the equivalent of Bank of Uganda here who actually believe that, <laughs> that, that, that the President Museveni is, is, do, is working tooth and nail to finish off their country. And that's what they've been told. So every... You know... Me, I think they could actually end up being a war between Uganda and Rwanda. And if that war came to be, my own guess is the chances so, so are... For me, I want to stop and, and listen to what others are saying. And if that war took place, my own guess is Rwanda would win. And if, if Rwanda went to win the way they won in Kisangani, I don't know where we would be. And because the same war would open another war in Rwanda. The Hutus, from my own observation, are not sitting around doing nothing. They are also doing whatever they can do. So if the war began, the chances I would have a repeat of Kisangani and the I cannot calculate the equation on the other side inside Rwanda. And I have a feeling Kagame has a strong belief that he could win the war. And he may be, these are my guesses, I'm 
guessing this from very far away, thousands of miles away, uh, he may be monitoring the best time. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Rujinda. Also, thank you very much, uh, Elder Yoga. I, I want to also invite in uh, Sarah. What, what is your thought on this one? I want all of us to exhaust this area before we move on. What's your take? Yeah, thank you, Damien. You know, the, the visible conflict between Rwanda and Uganda started in 2000, escalated towards 2001 elections, where for the first time, Rwanda was named on the floor of parliament as an enemy of Uganda that cannot and no citizen should receive money from Rwanda in 2001 elections. That was the information from security and they have never withdrawn it. They have never reversed it. So the parliamentary record of 2001 still stands. After 2001 elections, we saw dissidents from both countries, Chakabar and Mande and others running to Rwanda for refugee and then the likes of Furuma and others running from Rwanda to Uganda. And that, you know, escalated the tensions between the two countries. Later, diplomatic efforts managed to restore relations through the Trapatite Plus efforts, as well as UK mediation under a clear shot then. But I think the mistrust remained. And what we are seeing today is the seated mistrust between the two countries, the seated, long seated suspicion between the two leaders, as well as the ego of the leaders, because I think we cannot take it far from the characters of the two leaders themselves. Prior to that, as Tegre said, there were the Chisangan clashes, of course, Chisangan one, two, and three. And later people seemed to have made peace. But the battle of UPDF and RPF as who is superior remained, even in the corridors as they talk now. It's as if they, they need to settle that battle of who is superior to the other either by overrunning Kampara or overrunning Chigari. So these are long, you know, long held suspicions, competitions, ego and mutual suspicion between the different leaders, both in the political establishments of the two countries and the military establishments of the two countries. Unfortunately, unlike other countries that benefit from peaceful change of power, these leaders have monopolized the power in their countries. And that also adds to the long-standing conflict that is now going in two, two, two decades plus because also of the characteristics of the leaders that are not leaving power. And some of also the unseated, you know, the, the hidden race between the, the two leaders is who leaves the power first before the other? Some people in the NRM establishment think that Kagame should leave before Museveni leaves, otherwise it becomes a problem for Uganda. Some people in the political establishment in Rwanda think that Museveni should first leave before Kagame leaves, otherwise we should, Museveni will become a problem for Rwanda's peaceful transition. So the, those are all hidden, invisible, and some of the visible issues that have escalated this conflict beyond two years. But currently we have the closure of the border. I think that is an escalation that didn't happen before, even given the East African context and, and, and what the treated demands on free movement of people, goods, and services between the member states. We have an embargo on, on trade between the two countries. Uh, 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 and there are efforts to mediate as usual by DRC and Angola. But also we see failure to fulfill the few commitments that are, uh, are made 
In this simple MOU negotiated by Angola and uh, by Angola and DRC in Rwanda. Whereas Uganda and Rwanda have released a few of the of the citizens arrested in each country after the signing of the MOU, Uganda has handed over 21 Rwandan citizens. Rwanda has released a total of 20, but each country claims there are more hundreds of, of their citizens arrested and, and detained by the, by the respective countries. This is the only commitment that was made in the MOU. There was a request by Rwanda that within 30 days of signing the MOU, Uganda should verify the rebel bases of, 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 of people seeking to overthrow the government in Rwanda aided by Uganda. Among the groups that Rwanda lists is the, national, the Rwanda National Congress, led by Nyamasa and Group. We have the Democratic Forces for the Liberation of Rwanda, FDRR in Eastern DRC, and another group. What came nearer to a confession on Uganda's side was in a letter to Kagame in March 2019 by President Museven, where he admitted to have accidentally held a meeting of representatives of dissident groups as well as their financier, known as Tribet Rujunjiro, in a letter. So there are these tensions, accusations and counter accusations of each country working to overthrow the leadership in the, in the respective countries. And this has been the case since the 2001 elections. I don't know what can be done differently. Of course, this conflict, as Rujendo says, has nothing to do with the people. Rujendo did mention, my brother, that the media have failed to find the problem. In communications by Rwanda that were seen in the media, in the latest developments, they mention the people, they mention their travel details with the dates and passport numbers, they mention their details where they went and what they were doing among the accusations against Uganda. When Uganda was asked to mention their issues, they only mentioned gross abuse of human rights. And I don't know whether really Uganda, given our own human rights record as a country, I don't know whether the leadership has a moral, moral authority to accuse their neighbor of abusing human rights when they are busy butchering their own citizens. Damien, I, I wish to rest my case. Uh, thank you very much, Sarah, for taking us through that much. I, we, we shall exhaust this, this area in a, in a few. I want to invite on uh, Joseph. What's your take, please? Um, I just want to say that um, my mind is brief, really, because um, fantastic presentations by experts. Um, all I can say very briefly is that um, I don't necessarily think that Rwanda is a, a special neighbor to Uganda. All Ugandan neighbors are special in the sense that uh, the dynamics between Rwanda and Uganda is the same as Kenya and Uganda, the same as South Sudan and Uganda and Congo, you know, we are neighboring countries and initiatives uh, and, and cross-border relations and by and large are the same. Uh, the only thing that happened in Uganda and between Uganda and Rwanda, uh, that was really in the 90s, was um, starting really from the 80s, was the dubious deal between Museveni and, uh, and, and, and the Rwandese um, to organize themselves to overthrow a legitimate and elected government in Uganda, one, but two, to advance that, organize it and create a situation in which Uganda with the Rwandese were able to go and um, create a new situation in Rwanda. Uh, and that said then, um, I would say that the, the dynamics really started in the 80s, but Sarah did a, a good job to try and take it back and indeed took um, uh, Comrade Gawawa to take it back to the 1990s. But I, su I, mean, I suggest that possibly it's not as late as 1997. 
um, this again must have started. For, uh, and it's quite clearly it's a matter between Mr. Museven and Mr. Kagame. These are two individuals who are basically playing with the lives of uh, Africans in Uganda, Africans in Rwanda, and indeed Africans across the continent. These guys know exactly what the issues are. I also suspect that a few guys close to them know exactly what the situations are. Ugandans and Rwandese are basically being used as equipment for these guys' egos, as Sarah rightly suggested, which is extremely unfortunate. Point is this, that um, what, was, what was the deal, what indeed was the deal in, in October 1990 when, um, when we invaded or helped to invade on behalf of the Kagame's run? What was the deal? How was it bound to be settled? If it was a deal that had been substantially and properly settled, then it may be the case that there is an ego question in which Mr. Museveni thinks he did Kagame and others a favor, and he should be seen as the, the Muje, the Muse, and, uh, and, and, and he should be honored as a king. And possibly Kagame now looks like a, a little boy who's turned rather rude to his father, and that's why he gives them a whipping in, uh, in Kisangani. And possibly Mr. Museveni with his ego and his guys, they can't believe that the guys who were basically streetwise in Kambala just a decade earlier <coughs> are now experts who, as Yoga suggests, are capable of possibly sweeping them across Kampala should there be an opportunity. I really think it is very much about that. But of course, underlying and under, under, underlying some of these issues um, might be, and will almost certainly be, interest questions for the individuals concerned. There may be interest issues strategically for nation states. I'm actually not quite sure what grand strategic interest the issues might exist, um, which contradicts uh, Uganda and uh, Rwanda's uh, 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 interest that possibly they cannot share beyond um, uh, some of the dynamics involving the external forces that uh, they, they very ably serve, meaning uh, uh, the imperialist powers that uh, an interest, whether it's in Congo, the geopolitical strategic positioning for Rwanda, and how these guys look at um, is it Congo, neighboring Sudan, uh, and the wider Central Africa. But really beyond that, as peoples, I think it's very much about egos for these people. And to an extent, I think Sarah is right. Um, if Museveni had uh, recognized that he's an old man who needs to retire and, 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 and sit down and play around with his grandchildren, and that Kagame has uh, a, decent, a decent go at the whole thing, starting from 1994, where he was effectively the chief of Rwanda to date, and maybe it would be in a slightly different situation where the two countries and the two peoples can discuss slightly much more strategic and genuine sisterly, brotherly relationship rather than something that we just, even Regenda, I'm surprised, <laughs> even Regenda, who's actually a journalist and a very fantastic investigative journalist, can only speculate unless Mr. Regenda is, is, is being shy on this. Can I say just one thing? Uh, Ocheno talks about the role of external powers. Something which Ugandans miss very much is that this so-called taking RPF back to Rwanda was really not a project of Uganda or even a project of RPF. RPF and Uganda were used. This was a British American project to cut the wings of uh, French imperialism in Rwanda. And the others were just used, including the interests of RPF was used by the British and the Americans to get their interests through. There's a lot of documentation on this. I just wanted to make that point. If I get it correctly, you're asking about, you're asking about the future of the community with all that is happening between Uganda and Rwanda, right? You know, of course, because then we know we are seeing uh, this, this is a, a country that is constantly threatened, maybe because of its size, but also because it's just from a period of unrest in-house. In, in, in so I think they also have the reason to, to defend themselves. Maybe one would argue that way. But now, where does that leave the future of uh, the East African community? I think the community has a future. Um, maybe because it's a case of uh, once bitten, twice shy, many people fear that uh, we just might see a scenario of the East African community collapsing once again. I do not think that is uh, very, very possible now because the dynamics um, in the 70s and 80s uh, were very much different uh, from what they are, or from what we're seeing today. Um, the 70s and 80s were a time of um, Africa trying to find its footing after independence. 
Uh, many states had just um, got in their independence in, in the late 60s, early 70s. And there was a lot of back and forth, people trying to fill the waters, trying to see how whether they can stand on their own. And in, a, in, in, the, in a situation like that, it was always going to be difficult um, for coalitions or for communities, or if you like, for any intergovernmental um, entities to peacefully continue, uh, for neighbors to coexist peacefully. I think it was a different world we're, talking about, we're seeing at the time. Uh, if you remember many, many, there were many, many coups in the 70s and in the 80s, uh, as Ugandans can testify. So it was a different uh, dynamic at the time from what we're seeing today. I think today, uh, if you look at the world as it is, I think we're seeing a, a getting together uh, of um, states basically trying to get into economic blocks, into political blocks. Uh, we're, we're seeing stronger uh, political and economic blocks coming up. So I think the, the dynamics are towards formation of blocks and strengthening of uh, those blocks and trying to see whether they can actually belong to more than one block at any one time. I think that is what is happening now. So because of the general wave that we see around, I think the what is happening between Rwanda and Uganda may not be big enough to reverse the tide as it is. Uh, I, I think I, I would want to hope that um, you're going to run the, uh, sort themselves out. I think a lot of stuff has to be, I think there is nothing that can be talked over and sorted out peacefully. Uh, like, the, like everybody agrees, I think the, the problem is between the leaders or the, if like the leadership, not between the people. We have no issues with, with the Rwandans. They're part of us. We are part of them. We, I myself, have, I have family here, I have family in Rwanda. So you can, you can no longer separate between Uganda and Rwanda and, and say, yes, there's this a clear dichotomy. So I think the sooner we sort ourselves out, the better. I, I think that on the part of the Ugandan government, we need to respect Rwanda. We need to acknowledge that they are a sovereign state, that they have earned the right to be where they are, uh, I must also point out, uh, as a person who frequents both uh, who frequents Rwanda, that I think if I'm comparing Uganda to Rwanda, the Rwandese are getting things right far better than we are here in Uganda. They're using their money better. They're using their authority better. Uh, you, you, a lot has been said about the authoritarian tendencies of, of the of, of the of the Kigali government. But if you look carefully, I think you can see what authoritarianism can do if handled, if channeled in the right direction, in the sense that, I mean, there is a bit of order. There is, you see money is being deployed. You see corruption being openly fought and visibly fought. You see, I mean, every time I go there, something has changed. It's going to be perfect right now. But I mean, you see a lot of change that you're like, guys, what are we doing back here? So I think Rwanda has earned the right to be where it is. We need to respect them. I must also point, point out as a person who covered the Kisangani clashes that a lot of what happened in Kisangani was because the Randis felt disrespected. I think the Ugandans were loading it over them, or oh, these boys, these boys, these kids, these whatever. And these guys said, wait a moment, <laughs> we're a sovereign country. We, we have a right to be what, where we want to be, what we want to be. And, and a lot of stuff evolves around that lack of respect. I think it's not a hard thing. Let us respect Rwanda for what it is. Let us even acknowledge that they're superior to us now in very many things, very, very many things. It's a more efficiently run country, a better, uh, if you like, a more efficient economy. Um, what, what are we doing shouting over them? If Rwanda is reacting to, if they're closing their borders, I don't think that uh, President Kagame is blind to the importance, the, to the political, political and economic importance of Uganda to Rwanda. I think there is a genuine problem. I have represented dozens, actually, if, if you like, scores of Rwandese. Uh, who are detained by the Ugandan regime. And every time we get them out of jail, they're no longer people. I'm telling you this with my heart bleeding. They are no longer people. And these are some of the things that are hurting the regime in, uh, in, in Kigali. You get their people by the dozens, torture them to smithereen. Some of them actually die. We, we buried some of them. It's sort of a very nice situation. I think we just need to sober up, uh, stop playing games. I think Rwanda is ready to work with Uganda. That is my reading. I think we're ready to work with Uganda, but Uganda is sending all the wrong signals, all the wrong signals, because like I say, the things that unite us 
um, stronger than those that actually divide us. I was in 2000, in, in October 2000, before everything went wrong, um, I, I had privilege to meet, to, to be with both uh, President Kagame and President Museveni at Interest School. And we moved together as, as uh, Mr. Kagame was showing us, and Mr. Museveni, this was my bed. This was I used to sleep. This was my little corner. This was, I was like, wait a moment, this is, there's so much between us, so much sentimental issues between us. We are, we are spoiling that history, spoiling that brotherhood, um, just because we think we're the big brothers. Uh, so I think we need to pull up our socks as Ugandans. The, the Randis, I think, will work with us if we get our act our, our together. Back to you, Damien. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Tegule. Uh, Elder Yoga, we, we are seeing uh, Rwanda, Uganda, first of all, is not in, in, in terms with Rwanda. But also we, we see uh, issues with Rwanda and Tanzania, Rwanda and Burundi, you know. I, I, I don't know, does it really sound well for, for the Federation if uh, the, the heads are not really uh, agreeing on, on a, a few uh, issues? <laughs> you are asking the wrong person. Uh, I have very little enthusiasm about this. East African Federation. I think it's a pipe dream which is not realistic at all. But uh, those are the views of uh, an, an elderly man who is uh, going out of the scene soon. Maybe the younger people like you have great enthusiasm in this. I really don't have much enthusiasm about it. I don't have much hope in the near future about it. I do, and uh, as I told you earlier, I'm not very keen at discussing this thing because I don't have the energy for it. I don't have the enthusiasm for it. Okay, then. Let me, yes. let me invite in uh, uh, Rugendo. <laughs> Maybe you'll have to take yes. this. Uh, the... Thank you very much. I have been burning to come in. <laughs> uh, because, because I see a dangerous narrative. You, but I, I am very quite sure that there is not going to be any war between Uganda and Rwanda. This one, you can take it to the bank for reasons that uh, my, my friend uh, Gawaya has explained, biological reasons and social structural reasons. Why? Because the people of Uganda and the people of Rwanda don't want to war. If they don't want to war, it will not happen across the border. It's not going to happen. It can happen in any, any other theater, but not just directly across uh, the border. And, and uh, that incident that I was talking about in, in 2000, I had just joined the Daily Monitor and I was reporting from Barra because I was the bureau chief. So I saw, I saw those, uh, those interactions between the two leaders. And, and I need to, to remind you, Gawaya, that very day when Kagame was in the, was in the goal post and Museven was the striker, the late Kategaya emerged from, uh, from, the, from, from the stands and then whispered to his guard to go and tell the president that something wrong was happening in Kampala. And you know what was happening? Chisa Besseje was announcing his presidential candidature and, and the, yeah. the, the football game all just ended there and everybody went their way. I don't know how the president left to go and sort out that matter. And, and, and nobody knew that actually Kagame, President Kagame was actually in the know about what was going on around Besseje. You can imagine that is the, the confusion that comes with this Rwanda, Uganda conflict that then there cannot be any war. And so, then what is likely to happen? Uh, number one, I think we are going to see uh, a war of words instead between the two countries. That is going to be sustainable, sustainable and it will be sustained in the media, on social media, and elsewhere. You know, try, try, try trying to outdo the other or who has the better argument. If you have noticed, most of the of the content in the war of words is, is, is insults, is abuse. So it's more or less like your brothers, you know, okay, what can you do to me? What, what, what the other one also shouting back, you realize that that's people trying to vent at each other and that's it. So I'm, you can and Rwanda will vent at each other and that will stop there. Secondly, and which is probably, probably more worrying, but probably might not ex explode, is a possibility of, of an arms race. If you look at uh, at uh, the budgets of the both countries this this year, this financial year, Rwanda upped its uh, budget. Uganda actually almost doubled it. 
and that tells you that uh, it's basically trying to to arm themselves for peace, you know, because if if there's a balance of forces in terms of military equipment, military capacity, then you have a, more or less like a, a, a China-US sort of conflict or a Russia-United States uh, of, of America kind of conflict. You know, you have people who are very, very strong, they have invested in, in, in their equipment and the best way is to show off and that's what is going to happen between Uganda and Rwanda. And, uh, and then, then, of course, what is now happening that has now, that has now panned out and will eventually, uh, okay, helps me to answer your question about the East African community, is the economic war. I see an economic war between Uganda and Rwanda, and, and I think that's where they're heading. Museveni and Uganda have decided, let's open up other areas. We are opening up Burundi, Tanzania, and uh, South Sudan, as well as Eastern DRC, to ensure that that, that, that the economic integration progresses on the economic side, and 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 and, and Rwanda responds by becoming the financial hub of the region, by projecting itself as the digital economy of the region, and then trying to make sure that you know you see Uganda, we are doing it better than we are doing it. Ultimately, who is benefiting? It is you and me, we the citizens, because. Once the giants realize that it is futile, it is even destructive to engage in a destructive war, we are better off fighting economic wars. We are better off fighting uh, an arms race, and we are better off fighting uh, an argumentative race. You know, so that then, then, then we, we see developments. I, I can see Uganda, and I think I, I, I really agree with the. I think was it Gawaya, Gawaya or I think Sarah, how the Rwandan government has built an efficient state in terms of service delivery, in terms of accountability for, 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 for the monies that they use from the, from the taxpayers. And, and, and this has sort of uh, uh, reverberated across the border. You see now the talk from the prime minister, the new prime minister now, Nabanja is about value for money. Everybody is talking about efficiency. Everybody is talking about it's is it because probably that there is some guilt in Uganda that probably a small country like Uganda is Dr. Rwanda is doing it better. And you have citizens here who admire the, the way they do their things in terms of efficiency. So how are we benefiting? Are we going to have the same happen here? It is happening, and 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 and, 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 and that's what I see. So mm. and finally, then, yes. in terms of how that portends for the East African community, I think President Seven has really, really, really uh, sold this integration idea better than any leader in the region, and everybody is beginning to see the the benefits. If somebody will tell you. I was asking. Um, one of the directors at Dot Services, the people who are going to be building the roads in the eastern, eastern DRC, and they were telling me their projection as just contractors is that the volume of business between the two countries currently it stands at about five hundred and twenty-nine billion dollars, uh, million dollars. Sorry. So they think that is going to almost triple to about one point five million, and, uh, and 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 these benefits really. We, have 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 the the advantage of latently pushing the need for integration. So whether some leaders want it or not, Africans, East Africans, Congolese, South Sudanese are integrating. They are crossing. They are talking to each other. They are sending each other emails. They are yes. sending each other products. They are sending each other matoke across the borders. And and actually, people don't care. Ugandans actually don't care that, that, uh, that, for example, Rwanda is angry at Uganda. Some Ugandans don't care. The same thing is happening their side. Some Rwandans would want actually to cross the border and come and, and tend to their cows here, you know? So, so whether leaders want it or not, whether military leaders want it or not in both countries, the social metamorphosis between 
the countries is going to force this integration to happen and 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 and, and, and this this force is is making leaders embarrassed that that how can you be talking about closing a border hmm? when we urgently need to sell our maize to to to, to, to eastern drc when we urgently need to sell milk to eastern, so where are we going to put, put this milk who's going to drink it who's going, where is it going to want to put it? it's uh, it's uh, it's uh, thank, you. thank you very much Regina. you know and 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 and, and, and that's, that's a good go, question that and, I, I will conclude this point in, um... let, just just a moment let me conclude this point by just giving you an analogy look at the wildebeest these these animals that cross crisscross kenya and, and, and tanzania what messages are they sending to us that animals are integrating we humans are not the animals here in uh, nguindi most times they they, are, they they come and sleep this side and then during the daytime they are in rwanda <laughs> and, uh, uh, and so are we going to fight about are we going to kill these animals in order to be able say that we cannot live together so if we want the world of this to 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 to, 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 to generate tourism money between kenya and, and tanzania integration is, is going to be very very important if we want the 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 gorillas to to benefit benefit both rwanda and uganda then you cannot engage in a conflict that is going to disorganize them and uh, probably uh, deny them their habitat these are some of the things for me that go, go go in my mind all the time and i have a very strong belief that there cannot be any war instead the war that is going to happen is the categories i've mentioned we are going to have an economic war which is already ongoing we even have, have are going to have a technological war which is only already happening and uh, a cultural war yes who has who has better well behaved people who has be a better workforce uh and in even an arms race because weapons Big weapons between countries are usually weapons of peace. And, uh, and yeah, think yeah, thank you. yeah, thank you very much, Rugendo. Uh, Sarah, you, Rugendo seems to be highly hopeful. And uh, right there, it, it seems to fit into your guys' uh, thought that the young people are possibly have uh, the anticipation of uh, this possibility. But is there the political will to, to ensure that uh, the integration is possible, going by what is happening? I think at most, and uh, the results can exonerate me, at most, given the deteriorating democratic credentials of several countries in the East African community, I think at most we can achieve an economic arrangement. I know people have a wild dream of being the first president of East Africa. It is not about to happen. People are first striking the, the East African Federation. How do you first track the East African Federation? With three out of six borders closed. Uganda Rwanda border is closed. The presidents are not talking. Uganda Burundi border is closed. Uganda DRC border is closed. And the president with the federation committee are busy running around saying they are busy to federate. How do you federate even when rats cannot cross over from your country? The, the presidents who reestablished the East African community, my uh, president, uh, Mukapa, we had the more in, in Kenya, and of course the constant <laughs> President Museven, who has become a constant in the region and part of the problem. I think they never thought, first of all, that some of them would be constants like we are having in Uganda. Secondly, in several debates, including the Pact for Security on Great Lakes region, Tanzania, by then, with the Honorable Jakaya Chukwete as a Minister of Foreign Affairs and Mukapa as a president, tried to move a motion that every country should have term limits, every country must ensure peaceful handover of, of power, that every country if they create dissidents, they should create a safe haven for those citizens to remain in their own country and they take care of them because of the cost and influx of refugees in the region. 
when you see what the leadership has deteriorated into today, you have life presidents now in, in Rwanda and, and Uganda. You have uh, Burundi, I think, he survived that life presidency syndrome. Tanzania, there were fears that the rate Magufuri might lift term limits. He has not, because Tanzania, other than the increasing electoral violence, has tried to be politically stable with the hand peaceful transitions, although it is still Chama Chama Pindus in power. So when you look at it, uh, and, and then the violence that happened in Kenya in 2007, when you look at the outlook, the democratic outlook of the East African community, any, any foreigner would think the leaders are mad to try to dance around the federation. We have failures in customs union and implementation of the common market. One day you hear Tanzania has just the chicken from Kenya. Kenya has just the milk from Uganda. Uganda has closed the border with Rwanda. South Sudan, which is a new entrant, is charging visas in total violation of treaty provisions. We are rushing to join in DRC and Somalia. And you can imagine the confusion that we are bringing on board. Can these entities that are grappling with the basic issues of civil and political rights, that are grappling, some are coming out of conflict and are struggling to implement peace accords. Others are, you know, infested with warlords. And every time there is a vote in parliament, then there are bombs on the street in Somalia. And then the other city, which is a hub of rebels. What would you be federating, Damien? I raised my Thank you very much, uh, Sarah. <laughs> and uh, I know there, is, uh, there are quite a lot of uh, minds that are tickled there. I just want to, to, to change our, our debate on the, on the identity uh, issues because we are getting into, we've gotten into the second hour of our conversation. And that's why I want to invite in uh, uh, Dugo Cheno. You, you need to start from here while also this feeds into the integration. Does identity politics bridge or divide? There's a common fallacy from uh, critics of identity politics that uh, politics is that uh, identifying and addressing differences somehow prevent people with uh, different histories, backgrounds, and ethnicity, uh, identity, or experiences from uh, finding commonality. Is this true? I have to say I have great pleasure of reporting that I recently read a document which really clarified me on a number of uh, identity issues. This document was written by an Israeli woman, and uh, she's talking about uh, liberation movements in the third world. And then she comes out making this contribution. She says the situation in the third world, in liberation movements in the third world, or on the question of identity, is determined by the issue of the economic base of these societies. That the economic base is not sufficiently developed to give rise to uh, political struggles on the basis of social classes. Instead, what happens is it gives rise to political struggles on the basis of identities. And I found this very brilliant so that it is not a question of choosing whether to have identity politics or not. It is the level of the development of the economic base which brings out the identity politics. Now, in my view, politics can only be run on the two bases, either on identities or on class. Now, from her argument that the economic base of our societies is not sufficiently developed to give rise to identification on the basis of, of classes, on the basis of social classes, and therefore give rise to political struggles on the basis of, uh, of, of social classes. So it becomes 
not something of choice. It's something of the nature of our societies that identity politics has to be practiced at the moment. And it becomes necessary that we have to resolve our identity questions before we move on to class politics. President Museveni has a very simplistic view of identity politics, I have to say. And the, the other day I listened to him talk about, uh, talk about identity politics in terms of economics, in terms of people who would buy his father's milk or his father's cows. There's a question of identities oppressing other identities. For millennium, the Bairus in Ankole have been oppressed by the Bahima. And he doesn't talk about this. He talks about saying that uh, it is the Baganda who come and buy my father's cows and then my father takes me to school. There is a question of identities oppressing other identities. This is not just in Ankole. In, in Rwanda, we have had the case of the Tusis oppressing and exploiting the, 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 the Hutus for millennia. Now, these things have to be resolved. These are democratic issues which come to the fore and have to be resolved. I don't know if I'm making any contribution there, but let me stop there and hear what others say about that. But this Israeli woman really explained these things for me very well. Thank you very much, uh, Elda Yoga. I, Tegule, this is uh, the point that I would want to, to hear from you as well. Yes, Damien. Yes, we're trying to, 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 to understand, give an understanding of whether is, does whether really identity politics really bridges or divides. Uh, which is a common fallacy in identity politics, where we see histories, backgrounds, ethnicity trying to, to, to take shape in finding uh, common uh, commonality. Do you think we can see uh, this happening? Is... I, I, I think, I, I'm hoping that I, I got your question correct, your question correctly, Damien. Mm. I, if that is uh, assuming you're talking about identity politics as uh, people defining themselves more and more by their origins, identifying themselves in the, in the more progressive sense as uh, nationals, as Africans, and as citizens of the world. Um, is that what you're trying to say? Yeah, carry on from there, yes. Yeah, I, I think there is, there's really little to be said on that because it's really obvious that um, I think where the world is now, we need to be defining ourselves more and more in ways that are progressive, that make, uh, that make it possible for us to work together with other people uh, rather than to um, build cocoons and walls around ourselves. I think that is, if you look at many, many of our communities, the people are defining themselves in the narrow sense, in the narrow sense. And if you look at um, the distribution of wealth, the distribution of opportunities, uh, the distribution of this and that is again going too much along that identity lines. Uh, this is one of us, either the ethnic identity or the political identity. I mean, it's about us, us, this is one of us. This is, this is the other side. This is one of them, them and us and this and that. And uh, I, I think that um, the demands of the world as we stand today uh, should tend towards looking at building bridges, looking at reaching out. Um, I come from the East, Sarah comes from the, from the West. Uh, you, you want to look at what brings us together rather than what defines us and then separates us. Because every time you go into the small definitions, then you're separating rather than dividing rather than bringing together. And you know, the world I think has gone past that. Every time you do that, you're taking the world backwards. I think it's um, important that we look forward and see how do we think together? How do we work together? How do we walk together? Back to you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, yeah. Uh, no, can I respond to that? Please come through, come through. Yes, I'll give you a, a second. I still emphasize we should ask ourselves, where does identity politics come from? It's not a matter of just dismissing it. 
I live in the U.S. There is serious identity politics here. The blacks against the others. Uh, across the border in Canada, there's serious identity politics between uh, Quebec and the rest of Canada. There was a time in Belgium when uh, Belgium went for four years without a government because of identity politics. There is serious identity politics in Britain, particularly blacks against the others, foreigners against the the recent immigrants against the the long-term immigrants. What was the, 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 the political force behind Trump's rise? Identity politics. <laughs> we need to find out where identity politics is. Secondly, we need to find out what is the alternative to identity politics. I believe there are just two, two alternatives, either identity politics or class politics. Uganda is not in a position to run its politics on the basis of class at the moment. Whether you like it or not, it is going to be run on the basis of identities. And we have to resolve the identity question before we move to class politics. Let me hear somebody else. Yes, uh, I, I think that's uh, Rujendo. Now you see where we are headed. And uh, you earlier had admitted that uh, without a doubt, uh, as East Africans, we shall, we shall have this integration. But you see, there's mult multiculturalism that is closely associated with identity politics or political and uh, social movements that have uh, group identity as a basis of their formation and uh, the focus of their political action. Uganda and the entire East Africa is bedrocked on these formations. Do you think there is a future for a possible and a sustainable integration having some of these as, uh, as barriers? I think for me, uh, when it comes to identity politics, and uh, I would want to actually agree slightly with uh, uh, Dr. Adola, because uh, the, 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 the fact is that you cannot do away with them. If I am a Muganda, you are a Mnyankore, another one is a, is a Chaga around Lake Victoria, and you decided to express yourself that way, there's nothing that's going to stop it. I think the issue, again, is what causes that. And normally what causes it is when certain identities come under existential threats, be it economic or even uh, cultural or social for that matter. And so they, 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 that, that then uh, ignite certain reactions that, that take on a, for a, an identity in nature. And, and that's where we should be assessing because you cannot do away with our identities. What 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 come what what goes wrong usually is when a certain identity takes an ethnocentric approach. Ethnocentrism in sociology is is where uh, uh, a, a, a given community or an ethnicity assumes superiority over the rest of the other communities, and and they would want to impose that to to, to impose their own values over mm -hmm. the others, and and that. And that usually is always very wrong, and we will definitely attract a reaction. And that is what happens in much of Africa, where certain identities want to superimpose their ideologies, their cultural configurations over the rest, especially smaller and weaker societies or weaker identities. So, one day I was interviewing uh, Desmond Tutu, and and I asked him in 2012. I asked him uh, to tell me what he thought about the future of Africa in terms of these very, very things. And, and, and his argument was that, uh, you know, identity is a good, is, is like a knife, okay? It's like that knife, a sharp knife. You can use it to kill a human being by stabbing them, or you can use the same knife to cut a nice piece of meat and serve everybody and they become very happy. And what was he trying to say? He was, he's pointing out a very important element in, when it comes to identities, and that is politics. Politics is what actually spoils identities. Political management. And, and, and that's where the cause starts. The, when you have bad politics of identity, it is usually the politics that actually soils identities because there's nothing wrong. You don't take away from the fact that I am 
I'm a Nyankore. You not take it, the fact that uh, uh, you Demian, you you, you Msoga for, for that matter. And 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 we live happily because that's how we have been. It's the it's the law of nature. But 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 the politics, the management of politics is the issue, is, is what we need to fix. And for me, uh, if it comes what once it comes to East African uh, integration, why I'm a strong believer in it, by the way, is that integration tries as much as possible to 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 the, what word can I use? Integration, especially economic integration, there is a way it devalues bad politics because it allows economics to, to, to be the driver of people's livelihoods, of people's social economic existence. So you will, you will notice that that to be able f- to have a trans-East African highway uh, or a, tra- a trans-East African rail line to progress and benefit everybody, then we have to put away our identities, our political enclaves, and work towards that. So the economics will force us. The, the trends, the world trends will force us. Technology will force us to, to, to push away politics of identity. Um, the yoga was quoting the, inc- the recent incident in the, in the US. Where is Trump now and his extremists? It is technology that, that, has, that has decimated that, that type of thinking, uh, because people have realized we have a country, we have we have America, we we, we have our, we have the economy to run, and so therefore we will not tolerate this type of behavior. And are you sure? Yeah, that's what I think. Because because uh, because I mean, uh, where are they? What has happened? Okay, don't live there. You could tell us, but I think we, we just read the we read the version of, of, of documents and, and the literature that comes out that is meant for us. And, and, and not the, dom- the domestic literature. I understand there is, for example, there is CNN America, and then there is the also CNN International, and the content is always different. We we look at, 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 at America in a different picture than actually what happens on the ground. But the 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 the, 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 the identities could be might be will always be there, but there are forces that that make sure keep that that we keep them in check. Good politics, democracy. And and, and 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 economics, which is which is what no. is, what explains integration, for example. Let me say one thing. Mm. There are, there are real democratic demands in identity politics. It's not just mm. bad politics. There are identities which oppress other identities. There are various forms of uh, oppressing other identities. Until we reach a point where we respect each other as identities. That what I like for myself, the respect I like for myself, I will accord you to. Until we reach that point, identity politics will still be there. The Kenyans are doing something very, very interesting. Kenyatta and the Royal Odinga are doing something which is very, very interesting to find a way of resolving the identity questions during elections so that uh, the strife which used to be during elections should go away. And Kenyatta is going out back, going out to recognize the historical grievances that other identities have suffered in the past and finding a way of resolving that and not just dismissing it. Now, you talk of uh, economics wiping out these identity issues. How come it hasn't wiped out the Canadian one? How come it hasn't wiped out the Belgian one? I told you earlier that there was a time Belgium went, Belgium went for four years without a government on the question of, because of the question of identities. Now, in the US, they have done a lot of things they have come out with a lot of policies to resolve the identity question of blacks and the whites. But it begins from recognizing that we have an, a real identity question. It is not a question of just bad politics. Now, you talked about Trump. Don't be surprised if Trump runs for the presidency again. He is beginning to rally the identity feeling arising from globalization. Now, what globalization has done 
is she has moved some jobs from the U.S. to other places. And this has given rise to the, 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 the identical question in the U.S., people beginning to question, where are our jobs going? And where is the rest of the world uh, uh, being at our expense? And Trump is beginning to work on that. And don't be surprised, Trump running again and probably even winning. Does the constitution allow that? Um, that is very interesting. He hasn't run twice. Oh, yes. <laughs> Trump has only run once. Oh. So he can run again. And I think Trump is running again. That's very and interesting. That, but that the, 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 I think, I think yeah, that's why I need to. Let me let, let me bring in. Uh, and let me come. Let me, let me bring, let me come in, in there uh, a little bit. Just a little bit there. Huh? And let him come and, in. And, that, and, that, and that's what, that, that answers my question. The point I was going to raise actually. What what what? Why Trump is coming back is because then America has reached what I would call an identity crisis. And, 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 and so I think at some point you need that crisis to be able to resolve the, the identity question itself. Kenya got that crisis and, and it, it is taking uh, political will to resolve it. In the US, it is taking economic will to resolve the question of identity. In Rwanda, it is, uh, they've tried to work around it. They have, I think they're using both political will you know, you have you have the narrative now. I am Rwandan. They don't refer to themselves as um, Hutu or Tutsi, and that is uh, that has got to do with the political will, and also the fact that they have gone into they, they have suffered from an identity crisis that uh, that eventually really almost ripped apart the entire country and left them I... stateless. And so, so probably probably okay. maybe you might want to think that. that I think Rwanda. Happens. There is an illusion. There's a lot of illusion about Rwanda. The identity crisis in Rwanda is raging. It is raging and very hard. I am in contact with the, with the Hutus, and it is yes. raging very, very hard. That is where, that's where, that's where I, I want I, to I, also get I hope you. I hope Pegasus will not say you, you, you are engaged in anti anti Kagame efforts by talking to Hutus. <laughs> okay, oh. now, gender, gender and, and yoga, yes. We, we, let me bring in Sarah, and uh, this is where I want, Sarah, we are talking identity uh, politics. Earlier on, uh, the, uh, Elder Yoga has talked about uh, the class struggles that possibly would have defined our, 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 our identity here, but now we're not there. We are, because of the economics of the day, we still have to fight with issues, tribal issues, cultural. Do you think this really helps the integration? Well, Damien, I don't know whether, but I want to, to underscore a few things. That there is a belief that identity politics is widely misunderstood or intentionally distorted in order to avoid acknowledging the ways in which identity shapes economy, democracy, and society. The feminism movement have taken it on to claim autonomy over their bodies, to organize and mobilize around identity as the first you know, point of contact. And many people think that identity politics is, is a critical tool for civic engagement and organizing. In our multi-tribal societies, for example, the, one of the longest debates in, in the Constituent Assembly, other than land, was the Schedule Theory of our Constitution, which lists the indigenous communities in Uganda. And in there, we have number 24 as Banyarwanda. And there is a contestation over Banyarwanda, over you know, a long spell of our history. But I'll get back to that as I conclude. So rather than organizing around the belief of systems, manifestos, and part affiliations, identity political formations aim at serving, you know, the political freedom of a specific group or constituency originally marginalized within a larger context. 
If you look at our tribal settings, yoga did hint on the Riru Vahima question, which was a bit you know, contentious during the time of kingdoms. But from there, and, and, and since we have two strong UPC people, for example, I would like to know what made contentious the question of Vanyarand in our history to the extent that even President Museven, who was the biggest victim of being profiled as a Mnyaranda, has taken on other politicians as Mnyaranda, including his latest clip that has gone viral, where he's profiling Honare Bumkasambide as a Mnyaranda, not a Muganda. Yet Mukasambide has a father who is a Muganda from Masaka and a mother with the Mnyaranda origins. So you have this troubling, troubling profiling in our politics whenever it suits a particular narrative. And I don't know why. But going into the bigger federation concept, of course, if we were, we were able to federate, that would diffuse the need for the marginalized groups to identify and, and fight for their rights. Because in a bigger political grouping, largely you have space for everybody as compared to our small national borders. Tom Mboya in his book, The Challenge of Nationhood, did write about the need to use tribalism for positive ends, for positive political mobilization, for development, including education, hospitals, and com large community development. It's a good chapter in, in that book. But largely our politicians have tended towards distorting tribal identity whenever it suits their narrative in critical political times. And I think that is fundamentally wrong, Damien. Yeah, true. And uh, right there, you hinted on uh, on uh, just the, the, the recent on uh, Mukasa Abid and what was happening. What is what the president said? I want to invite in uh, Tegule. Uh, identity politics in Uganda. Let's bring it home. Why now? What does this mean for the future? Is the country moving backwards or to 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 to, to the bad and the tabulated politics? Why why are we bringing this uh, at this point in time? What do you mean, why, why I will bring this? What exactly do you mean? The, the talk of, of, of the identity talk. Uh, no, you see it is now becoming so, so, so pronounced. And from the head of state of all. Yeah. Um, what has the head of the state head of said? The, the risk that you say on Mukasambi Day, if you, if you really followed that, that, that talk and trying to... Him. And of course, the, 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 the quotes that also Mukasambida has been uh, uh, having on, the, on the, the, the media in Rwanda really, really sense some of these uh, negative uh, uh, identity questions. Yeah, um, what I'll say one thing. First, the head of state often sets the narrative. Um, his pronouncements become a source of policy but they also sometimes reflect the narrative that is on offer or uh, that is obtaining at the time or that is being instigated at the time. Um, what I'm not sure about is because I think he's, for Mr. Yoga, I think what, what Mr. Museveni said about two, three weeks ago was that uh, I think he was talking about Mukasa Mbide. He was saying uh, Mr. Mbide is a Munyarwanda, he's not a Muganda. Um, and, and he took time to say that at, at a public gathering. And um, I found that a little odd. I found it a little dubious, but I'm not sure whether he was targeting Rwanda or he was targeting Mbide. <laughs> you know, I think that, that, that's where I, I, I was unsure. Is he trying to hit uh, President Kagame in Chigali or is he trying to hit Mbide who is uh, supposed to be on the opposition um, in Uganda? And let me also clarify that 
Bidja's status, by the way, is not very, very clear. Talk, it will be wearing green today and another color tomorrow and something else the other day. Uh, wherever it suits him, that is Bidja's kind of politics. He's a typical politician, by the way. Uh, the, the, the question of principled politics is not part of, is, is not his forte, really. He, wherever is, is going to benefit, whatever, whatever is going to benefit him, he'll go with it. So I think that is what I'm not sure about. But I can say that um, this, is, this has been Mr. Museveni's way of uh, doing business, political business. That is, uh, he divides you, he gets you hitting at each other, and then he manages the, the commotion to his advantage. That is how he works. And uh, it serves his interests if he wants to stay long in power, because then if you, if you have Ugandan speaking as one, then it becomes inimical to the long-term strategic interests of the, of the seven presidency. Uh, but if you have them divided, then uh, he becomes maybe the only commonality or rallying point, and that works wonders for him. So I, I think that is, uh, that is to be expected if Mr. Museveni is um, making political statements. And let me also point out that, again, that is where we see, if you compare Mr. Museveni with uh, more enlightened presidents around, that's where you see a statesman and a politician. Uh, if you talk about statesman, I think that Mr. Museveni would probably not fit that description. That's too big for him. A politician, yes, is a quintessential politician, managing everything to his advantage and uh, advancing his interests, regardless of the consequences, whether national, regional, or international, or otherwise. So I, I was very disappointed by that particular pronouncement against, uh, uh, regarding Mr. Ambide. And uh, you want to hope that as a country, we shall reflect more on the need to manage identity in a way that advances the country, in a way that builds this country, in a way that unites us. There is nothing to, be, to, to benefit by over-defining ourselves by what we, what, where we come from, is if that is going to become a basis uh, for rationalizing national or political decisions and saying we're giving this road because of this area. We are doing this because, we're giving this job because uh, 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 Damien comes from Bosoga or from Bonyoro. We're giving this thing because the channel cannot be trusted to manage this, so let us give it to somebody else. I mean, that is how we are running the country, uh, Mr. Samson is running the country today, and I'm saying that that is where identity politics then, then becomes a big, big problem, completely inimical to our long-term strategic interests as a nation. Back to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh... Uh, Tegule on that one, yeah, you've really broadened it. I want to, to, Joseph, are you clear now? We had lost you earlier. Yeah, it's extremely frustrating. Um, at the beginning, we we're having a chat with, a joking chat with Rujendo about uh, uh, the advance of technology and the new world. And uh, the experiences I'm having are quite clearly the case that, um, uh, unlike what Rujendo was talking about, about the power of um, arms race, you know, is actually extremely important. I think I just got uh, uh, my impressive brother, uh, Gawawa, there talking about uh, statesmanships uh, versus others. Uh, and that is that um, um, this country, oh, yeah. um, if just, uh, just we were yeah. properly... Um, yes, we, 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 uh, we were trying to, 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 uh, trying to understand yes. The, yes. the issue of identity politics in Uganda today. Why is it coming out now? Especially from the utterance that uh, the president said on Mukasambide, but also we, we've seen there the are some yeah. uh, writings that, uh, of course, have been happening with Mukasambide. Of course, we, we don't want to, 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 to uh, zero it to these, to these two uh, people, but we, we've also seen him trying to write uh, and saying that possible uh, the, the president is trying to attack Banya Rwanda in, in a way. But we are trying to say, why is this coming out now? What does it have? Is the, wh where is the future of Uganda today with this kind of uh, direction we are taking? I think Uganda, East Africa, and the entire continent needs African leadership. It's really a question of leadership, part of what Gagawa was talking about. Um, you know, the, it's extremely rich that uh, Mr. Museven amongst all other people who've been leaders in this country should discuss the question of identity. Much earlier, before I had difficulties with my line, I was actually trying to build a case which I was, unlike, unfortunately, not able to do so. Um, when the NRA, uh, uh, NRM and RPA were building themselves in Uganda, part of their base was very much about uh, uh, the identity, emotive identity lines of them versus us. Uh, but that said, 
I, I think uh, I saw him play rather successfully uh, against the Nuuk guys outside Buganda. That uh, uh, it's sort of like uh, Nuuk is a Chiganda thing. While actually he himself used Buganda extremely successfully uh, to build around Buganda versus other court band, to suggest that uh, um, this country is possible in diversity. We see it from the first robotic government, uh, where um, we were able to bring together not only all Ugandans in diversity, but we actually successfully em uh, embraced uh, uh, other regional neighbors, including the dynamic politics of uh, uh, border politics, where this film on Mateke in uh, the other end near Katuna. Or, or the agro worries in, in the borders of Kenya. So I'm really not sure whether it's about these things. To me, I think it's a, a question of uh, uh, having men and women who are su sufficiently conscious, uh, uh, purposefully uh, uh, political, if you like, uh, that are driven by really the need and desire to build a, a, a nation so far off, far fetched, considering the direction it's taking, especially in as long as Mr. Museven and Mrs. Mrs. Museven and Kagame are around, I really don't see going anywhere. That um, in, in Uganda, we, there's evidence we've lived in diversity before, and uh, there's no reason why we can't live in diversity uh, uh, again. In, if anything, um, I know Mr. Museven is playing a game, and including more recently, if you see the question around how he's beginning to re, re embrace the North versus the East and cleanse it, he knows the policy of identity works. Unfortunately, politics of identity works when you play into the sentiments. The problem possibly is the class of yours, Mastesa, where you play history, it depth of, and I think yoga is the expert on this. It is for us to, to be able to, 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 to live together. But I'm sorry, maybe I am coming in on an angle in which I don't know the line that has been taking place in the last 20 years when I was actually in the, in the ghettos of Bukedi, which is now the second uh, most underprivileged next part of the nation. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Masese, you are asking yeah. why now? Yes. I think there is an answer in Ofono Pondo's recent article, which I treat as very significant, where he was analyzing the decline of the support NRM has enjoyed in the country. Mm. And then he came and talked about NRM losing Buganda. Now, what is happening is there had been some illusions for some time about the NRM. And this had made people su suspend their belongings to political groupings based on identity. And the, from Fono Pondo's article, I see him identifying particularly in Noob's success in Buganda. Now, my own view is Buganda is going back to similar things as the period of the KY. Now, to, in my own view, I think the, 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 the Protestant and the Catholic uh, cleavage, which used to be in Buganda, has been resolved. And Buganda in Inup is going back to the, the, to the politics of KY versus the rest. Now, my own thinking is, as we go along, more and more people are going to peel off from the from the NRM. And as they peel off, they are going to go back to their identity politics of the previous years. And when they go back to the identity politics of the previous years, you will see a revival of DP, a revival of, of UPC, a revival of something of KY. And NRM will end up being very naked. I don't know what you have to say about that. And before I go, <laughs> Interesting. I would like to I, I would know. like to share the views that, that I read from yes. that lady, that Israeli lady, with some of you after this conference. Thank you very much. We'll be glad to to have that uh, document shared with us. Uh, thank you, uh, Rujendo. Come in here. You see, there is there is quite a lot that has come through. And of course, now it has got into the, the, the politics of, of the day, uh, trying to identify with uh, with uh, with uh, with uh, these uh, uh, questions of, of, of tribe and, and uh, culture. Is, is this the future of uh, Uganda? The, where we are headed now? Rujendo, are you there? I think Rujendra left. Uh, there's a sign that he 
actually left, so he had issues, I'm sure. Ah, oh, sorry. Asara, uh, could have you? Well, I I agree with the part of the issues, the views shared by Yoga. And the Buganda given the, the partner that they voted, whether they are going back to Kabaka Eka or not, on that one, I, I don't agree. But given the pattern, how they voted, the regime is annoyed with Uganda. Previously, Uganda had about 10 women MPs that were either Vahima or Vanyaranda. I think they are eight, there were eight Vahima MPs in Uganda and two Banyaranda MPs in Uganda, especially the women. But of course, there is a question of Banyaranda, especially in Uganda. And then now the Bahima who dominate districts of Zimbabwe and other neighboring districts in Kato Corridor, as well as parts of, of Uganda. So the, the, the pattern of voting, where 23 Uganda ministers we are defeated in the last elections, including vice president. They do not amuse President Museven and his regime. All his since elections, there is an attack on Uganda in one way or the other. So the latest is the attack on Mbide as an individual and singling him out as a, as a Nyaranda. But when you look at other, including ministers that the president has appointed before and currently, we all know some of them have traces of Banyaranda, but I will not mention that here. I don't know why being a Banyaranda becomes a political question in Uganda whenever convenient. Yet the Constituent Assembly resolved that under third schedule of the Constitution by capturing Banyarwanda as a 24th indigenous community in Uganda. I, I think we need to move from that, you know, I, I, I want to call it blackmail. I, I come from Western Uganda, where being a Banyarwanda really is not an issue. We have seen situations where we grow up with, in one way or the other, Banyarwanda in our homes, Banyaranda through intermarriages, Banyaranda as domestic workers in our families. So to us, it cannot become a political question in the West. But in the Central, it becomes a political question because of the profiling that has existed before and is persisting now. But having Banyaranda as part of our constitution, I think we need to move to make it in Rwanda because it becomes a constitutional question. It becomes a constitutional question. And to me, what became so saddening, having grown up in, in, a, in an NRM stroke UPM government, we witnessed how whenever President Museveni's name was mentioned, everybody would jump to call him Mnyaranda because of the political profiling of that time. So I was so saddened that the biggest victim of Mnyaranda profiling in our politics also takes to the podium as a fountain of honor to also profile other people politically. To me, it was a saddening statement. But away from that, what do we need to do as a nation? Progressive countries have found ways of deconstructing the problems around tribal and racial profiling in their politics because they tend to be divisive. The problems around tribal and racial profiling in their politics because they tend to be divisive. Some of them have done this through personal storytelling as a powerful tool to expand lenses through which the world can, can uh, uh, through which the world should view these issues 
And at times, the therapy weave an underlying civic fabric that is diverse and as a foundation of a new common ground. So one would assume that having resolved these questions in our constituent assembly, that we had forged a new common ground of where all Ugandans are embraced their diversity. But if the symptoms are still persisting, then maybe this is where we should resolve these persistent questions in our society formations that should not that should have ceased to be political debates in our discourse. Thank you very much, Sarah. And uh, almost you've uh, you've got us to 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 the closure. So I, I want us to just in a, in about thirty seconds each to to give us our <laughs> final parting shots and. Uh, I, I possibly will, will have to start with, uh, with uh, uh, as we started. Uh, but Rujendo, you didn't get an opportunity to, to speak in this area. So I will start with you. So you'll give us your one minute parting shot as we also conclude generally on, on this uh, uh, topic that we've been engaged with today. Oh, oh thank you very much. I think um, predicted we, None of us has been able really to tell what the problem is. And that is what it is. And so my parting shot would be that actually, I think for me, I'm still insisting there wants to be a war between these two countries. And what is going to happen is um, we're going to see more agitation in other areas where they, they opt to compete for security. And that is probably political prowess, economic prowess, and social prowess. However, um, the, the issue of identity is, is a debate that keeps going on and on and on and on. And I'm not surprised that it's even serious. But it tells you that you cannot share your identity. It remains with the, the issue remains with the, with the politics and the political management of identities. So the, 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 the solution is always around the political mm -hmm. management of identities and other issues. Identities on their own are not bad, but if they are poorly managed politically, then you get a problem. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and for me, Maybe to get to the point, I can see that this, this issue of, um, of uh, Our profiling is where... Our time is fast, right? so you need to... Oh. Yeah. Okay, no, I want to say something on, on, on Bide. This issue of Mbide, I, I, I got it halfway, and uh, everybody is wondering why the president was talking about it. So I, it's not him mentioning it. Because he was, he was, because he said, Mbide is a Rwanda here in Uganda. Because if 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 Rwanda is a tribe, uh, well created for in the, in the in the in the constitution, why should any mention of it become an issue? Why is it becoming an issue? Mm -hmm. And that takes us back to to where it all started. Who started profiling identities in this town? I don't think. I, I, yeah, I, I really, I really don't want to blame the, this kind of profiling started way long in the seventies, and uh, you know, you know, targeting. You know what happens? What happened in 1982, 83, where people were targeting particular people, especially in my area of Mutunga, it was really serious. Where people in Rwanda and their houses and their properties were being confiscated for targeting because a certain rebel leader was thought to have been a Mirwanda. And, and and that has kept on going and, and I think it even went and I, I, if you read uh, for example this book Don't Disturb uh, by Michelle Rong, you'll see even how it was an issue even during the Bush War uh, you know uh, you know the northern, the, the, the northern hemisphere of Uganda you know versus the southern 
was like the Bush war was the rise against the, 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 what had been the hegemony that of the of the northerners that that had been bestowed upon this country by the colonialists. If you read Mamudan, for example, politics and class formation in Uganda, the the the. The, the, the issue of thousanders and northerners was an issue that was propagated at colonial time mm -hmm. and and so there, there was always that uh, profiling that these are and, uh, thousanders and thousanders tend to be to carry that tag called Banyarwanda and everything that comes with any political system that is associated with thousanders it is always going to end up being a Banyarwanda versus mm -hmm. in the rest of Ugandan issue so it is the politics, in my view, and, and the politicians have to stop this. If they do not stop it, then it is, it's we, 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 we are having these discussions uh, to stop. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Rugendo. Uh, then I want to, to invite in uh, uh, Tekula, are you clear now with your network? I want you to also give us your last parting shots uh, in about uh, 30 seconds. Me? I think I also saw Tegule left leave again. So, oh, he's there. Good. No, I, I just want to say that uh, one, thank you for inviting me to be part of this wonderful panel. I've enjoyed the exchanges. Thank you very much to everyone who has been part of this. I also like to hope that uh, the Uganda Rwanda issue is later. I think. We do need each other. I think there's a lot that we can learn from each other. And I think Uganda. Hello? Someone is. Uh, Why disconnected? It's the Gule's network. Someone is uh, trying to disorganize him. I can you go on? Can you carry on? Is it okay now? Okay, no, I'll say that there is a lot we can, run, we can learn from Rwanda because their efficiency in implementation of, of public policy is amazing. These guys are getting things right while we are consistently getting things wrong. I think we need to... It, humble pie, uh, join hands with Rwanda because they are our brethren and say, guys, how are you, guys, how are you succeeding where we are failing? And uh, then we shall, we shall be winners by doing that. I think the, the, let the olive branch come from both sides and we stop this foolishness because we, we do need each other. Thank you and uh, God bless. And thank you very much, uh, uh, uh Elder Yoga, you 30 seconds parting shots. Oh, 30 seconds is very little. <laughs> There's not much I can do about it, but oh, I'm just great. grateful to have been part of this thing. The first time I've been part of it, it has been quite enlightening. I hope I will be allowed to come back again. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, uh, yeah, Elder Yoga. Uh, Joseph, you've been largely off today. Yeah, it has been extremely sad. It's typical of uh, a system that sometimes doesn't work. No, my very quick one is, very, is, is this, that uh, really uh, all of us are possibly just uh, smoothing around these things. Uh, the, 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 the conflicts between Rwanda and Uganda is basically uh, Museveni and Kagame, they know it, and some of us actually know what the underlying issues are. Uh, the identity questions is quite linked also too. Uh, I, I don't agree with... Uh, with uh, with uh, uh, Arunatria, and we don't really want to bl put blames here. The Rwandese question did not start in 1982. In fact, Museven and Kagame to blame because uh, when Ugandans, including Kanungu, started, uh, and Tungamu started uh, uh, claiming that Rwandese citizens were involved in a, in a national conflict in Uganda, it was true because Agam there is evidence that Kagame were already there, Kagame and others, way back in 1981. And that is the link between Museven and Kagame, but again, it's possibly too little for this, this space here. Maybe really all I can say is that having learned from what we learned at that time and before that time, and having learned from uh, the genocide in Rwanda, how the Rwandese themselves in Rwanda understood these things, pushing it fast forward. How did Rwanda become a tribe in Uganda? I don't think that is a settled matter. It is only settled when Uganda is responsible. We decide to leave it in harmony because that in itself was not 
necessarily something we should done in consensus with all Ugandans. But I think Ugandans need leadership, a leadership in which there is space in Uganda, as Tegule seems to be suggesting in Rwanda, where there is space for all, where there is democracy, where there's openness, where there's fairness, where there's justice, where all Ugandans feel they can share the cake. All these questions of identities become irrelevant. Yeah, thank you very much, Joseph. That's, that was a, a powerful one to, to, to close. Uh, Sarah? Jo jo Joseph, jo jo Joseph is having, uh, I wanted to make a clarification. Joseph is having uh, uh, technology issues because this type of technology came during the NRM time. No, no, no. During UPC time, there was no technology. This, this, this not... <laughs> Why do you go to discuss other people's conclusions? You know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, team. <laughs> my parting shot is twofold. Uh, one is that uh, there is no conflict between the people of Rwanda and Uganda. The conflict seems to be with the leadership political and military leaderships of this country. And my call to them is simple. They should not assume that they are larger than their countries. They might be in power today. It doesn't matter how long they stay in power, but time will come when they will leave that power. So they need to leave, to let these countries to breathe beyond their egos. They should stop disrupting the lives of the ordinary people that are socially connected, social relations, family, marriage, friendship, trade, property, at the expense, you know, just to satisfy the, their own feelings of either controlling, you know, causing regime change or controlling the, the, the armies of other countries, whatever it is that they want to control. This conflict does not make sense. I know that there is no war that can happen without a, a citizen base. So it doesn't matter how long you will take bickering between the two of you. The people are not with you and they will never be with you. Stop the big caring and leave your nations to breathe. On the question of, of, of identity politics, we are what we are, first by our families, our parents, our gender, and our tribes. We cannot run away from it. Even in national documents, I, I, I used to get disturbed of of what tribe are you in every national document? You have to keep explaining you are Mnyangore, you are Mnyangore. So, how come this is convenient for official documentation and is not convenient for social, for political mobilizing and affiliations? I, I think we should stop the double standards. What I would hate is using political identity for discrimination and segregation. And it is also happening in several sectors. We have jobs that are dominated by some tribes against the political provisions in our constitution, in our national objectives and directives of state. We are mandated, you know, not to promote. At times, and, and even as Westerners, at times you get scandalized, you know, scandalized. You look at the lineup, especially in security forces, and you're like, for 35 years, can't we break the chain of the 27 that took up guns and fought? You still see the same pattern. But when other regions vote in a block, then it becomes a problem. I saw the article of Uganda saying, how come Vanyankore, ever since NRM came, the West has been voting for NRM above 85%. It has never become a problem. But when Uganda voted for NU, then it became tribalism. Then we have to see tribal profiling of politicians. I think this does not take us anywhere as, as, a, as a country. I thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. You've actually started another debate when we are closing. And uh, <laughs> I will not allow this to, to, to proceed. We will need to end from here because our time is uh, well spent, fast spent, yes. Uh, 
Thank you very much. You want to say something? Your agenda must be itching for rebuttal. Your agenda must be itching for for rebuttal, but uh, I think I'm. Oh, young Rujendo, it's over. <laughs> no, I am. Uh, I am. I am. I am I'm very. <laughs> I'm not jittery. I am just wondering. You, you've been humble. Uh, you've been humble today. See you. <laughs> really, 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 really. <laughs> Rujendo, see you next. Yeah, thank time. you, thank you very much, thank you very much, uh, Elda. <laughs> Rujendo, see you next time, young yeah, team. Thank you very much, Elda Yoga. Thank you very much, Sarah. Thank you very much, uh, Rujendo. Thank you very much, Joseph. And uh, of course, Ategule, who later jumped off. But thank you very much for being part of this conversation, my regular panelists. You always give power to this conversation. You always give power to this uh, forum. And uh, it's growing. It's growing because of your all inputs. Thank you very much, uh, Yoga, the, the distance you've been to, to chip in to here. And also technology. You've uh, finally caught up with technology. Thank you very much for enduring and staying on this long. And to our viewers out there, thank you very much for following these conversations. Thank you very much for being part of these conversations. And like I always say, kindly subscribe. Go to your YouTube channel, the Civic Space TV. Kindly hit that subscribe. Be part of these conversations. Put your comments there, your reactions and your feedback. We'll capture them for improvement and also for reactions and also to the benefit of the other, other citizens out there. Also, we are streaming live on Facebook. Here every Friday, we say thank you very much. This is the chat show on Twitter, chat show UG. Chat show UG, that's the Twitter hashtag. And the discussion is on there. We meet next time and next Friday. God bless you all.